Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back Judy Mae Murphy, super coach. I'm not going to go into any more details about how great she is until I welcome her. Judy May, welcome back. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Barry. It's a pleasure to be here again. I, fo I follow you on Facebook. You're jetting all over the world. How exciting is that? I love it. It's, it's my dream come true. And basically, I think as a coach and as a speaker, if you're saying to other people that you can help them to make their dreams come true, well, the first thing you need to do is make that happen for yourself. And part of my dream has always been to be in lots of different cities. So, as you know, every, every week I'm in at least two different places somewhere around the world and loving it. So you, you're racking up the frequent flyer miles. I am indeed, you? yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're coming back. Things have progressed fantastically for you. What do you attribute this heightened expansion for you? I think it's the same as what got me from uh, where I was originally to the last time we met. And I was already doing very well, you know. I, I mean, I already had a few books out in a few different countries. Now it's at sort of seven books in 28 different countries. And all the different things I've achieved is really about sticking with it and noticing what's working. So saying to yourself, you know, well, you know, I've been trying this for a certain amount of time. Is this working for me or do I need to try something else? Rather than just kind of getting into a pattern and saying, well, it's fine, it's working well enough, I'll just stick with that. Being really vigilant for what, what's working, what's feeling good, what needs changing, what do I need support around, and constantly growing, just learning. I, I myself like continuously, you know, read and go to seminars and do whatever I need to do to get that knowledge to take the next step. Now, all right, for reading, what do you really hone in on and to read? Um, I've got two criteria for when I read. The first thing is I read around areas that I don't feel I'm strong in. Because sometimes when we feel really strong in an area, when we think I'm good at this, we tend to want to go back to that. So for example, if people are already really good at business, they tend to buy business books. And they might need to instead be buying a relationship book. Because perhaps there's someone at home who's sort of thinking, oh, I wish you'd work just as hard on this. So for me, I just I identify what part isn't working so well. And then what I do is I find the people who I believe are the best at that. So these days, um, you know, it's great that there are so many books out there and it's great that, that so many people are self-publishing as a way to get the, get the word out. But often the quality of books can be quite diluted. There can be good messages in there, but I think it's strongest when it comes from someone who really knows what they're talking about and has been studying it and living it for years. So I try to go for people who are absolute experts in their field. So in other words, you check in with other people to get, like a doctor, you want a referral for who's going to be the best in whatever you're seeking knowledge in. Absolutely, and sometimes even just the way that a book is written, you can tell, you know, well, this is for me, this is, you know, I like a lot of detail. I'm, I'm quite a, a geek, and these days I, I coach coaches is mainly what I do. And so for that, I need to really know the technical stuff, and, and I love it. Now, since you fly all over the world, literally, what do you see as the similarities and differences between coaching, let's say, in Dubai versus New York? Okay. So, in fact, uh, three places I've been in the last few weeks are Kenya, Dubai, and New York, all completely different places. So, in Kenya, I had the privilege of um, teaching in a school. And the thing there is that they are so grateful for any piece of learning. I was out in the Maasai Mara, so I was um, teaching kids that are part of the Maasai tribe. and. They just wanted to hear anything that you had to say because they knew that that would be important somehow. Just having knowledge would be important and they're absolutely insanely grateful for every little thing that you have to teach them. And, and, and likewise, I was just as grateful for everything they were teaching me. And then um, you go to Dubai and, and there I was um, coaching uh, business people, very, very successful business people. And they tend to be a little bit more skeptical because they, they've got a lot of information. So it, it, it's right, it makes sense that they would ask a few more questions and sort of say, well, hold on a second, I've heard someone else, another speaker came in last year and seemed to be saying something different. So I love that, that I can say to them, okay, well, it seems that we're saying something different, but in fact, we're saying the same thing, just approaching it from different angles or, you know, whatever's going on. And so for them, they want more proof. They're not just going to take you at face value. And I'm very happy with that because I have the proof. I have, you know, the examples to back it up. I've been in this game 12 years now. So, you know, I can give an example of pretty much anything. 
And uh, so the difference then with, between Dubai, say, and New York is, first start, New York is just much more eclectic, much, uh, much more hectic and busy. And um, so you, you find with people that all the dreams are very, very different. And I love that. That's what I love about coaching people in New York is you might have one person that wants to start their carpentry business, another person who wants to have their own huge financial firm on Wall Street, another person who might want to be a model. So I, I love that about New York. But the thing that links all of them is that everybody is hungry for a dream and then hungry to work that dream. So they're starting their dream. That's the first step is to have a dream so you can go for it. Yeah, and, and I think that would be basic, right? Yeah, but it's not always so no. simple and basic. Mm -hmm. What is the next step, doing the homework and researching it? Well, I, I say the next step, once you have a dream, is testing that dream to see if it's the real dream. Because a lot of people have sort of impotent dreams. They have a dream that they think is theirs, but it isn't really. It, it's kind of what they think they should want. So, for example, you might have someone who thinks that they should want a beach house. And if you really get in there and question them, it's like, oh, so you like the beach, do you? How much time do you spend on the beach? Whenever you've got a free day, do you go to the beach? Like, well, no, I don't. I, I, I like staying in the city. Well, are you sure you want a beach house? Let's test that. How about you go and rent a beach house for a week and see if you like it? I was the same way. For years, I had this Porsche Boxster on my vision board. And it's a great car. It's a fabulous car. But then I realized, you know what? I don't actually like cars. I don't like driving. I've, cars just leave me cold. They just don't resonate with me at all. But what I do want is I want to be able to be driven everywhere. And now I have that, that every city I'm in, you know, I just have a, have a driver who takes me all around the place. So we've got to find out, you know, is it the real dream? Another thing is that people have a dream that they've inherited from someone else, like that their parents might have had disappointed hopes and they've unconsciously inherited those. It might be that, you know, someone just says, well, I, I just want to make a lot of money or I want to be a teacher. And you find out that really that that's what was their parents' dream for them that they haven't shaken off. They're living somebody else's dream. They're not happy. Exactly. And they're wondering what's wrong with me. I have everything I ever wanted, but it's not what they wanted. Another challenge that people have is that there's such a thing as sort of a cultural expectation. So if, um, like if I'm speaking particularly to teenage girls, because some of my books are for teenage girls, and um, when I'm speaking to them and I sort of say, what are your dreams? They all say, um, I want to be a model or an actress. And they really haven't learned how to dream for themselves. And all it takes is a little bit of questioning. Well, would that feel good to you, being in high shoes and, and you know, skimpy dresses in, in the cold? Is that really what you want to be doing with your day? And they, they sort of admit, well, no, that's not really it. And when they start to discover that they want to be scientists and, and make great discoveries, and that they want to you know, be lawyers, they want to be mothers, they, when they start to really tap into why they're here, they equally get very, very excited. But it's not just the teenage girls. With them, it's obvious. When someone says, I want to be a model and they're five foot two, you, know, <laughs> you realize there's a bit of coaching to be done around that. But a lot of people have dreams that aren't, in fact, their own dreams. I see that when I read books on self-help stuff, uh, they're living somebody, their parents' dream or their mother's dream or, you know, some relatives that said, oh, you should be doing this or doing that. Yeah. But I think the whole thing is finding the steps to realize, you know, this is not what's for you or maybe you should be recareering. Is there a test that somebody can take or... It's just asking the right questions and analyzing it. It really is just starting to navigate according to what feels good and starting with the end point in mind, knowing where it is you want to get to. And it's as simple as, do you want to be working indoors or outdoors? Do you want to be working with people or on your own? Do you want to be doing intellectual work or physical work or a combination of the two? And just constantly asking tiny, simple questions like that. That's really what coaching is. It's helping people to hone in on what feels great to them and then giving them that permission that it's okay to make decisions just based on what would feel good. It doesn't have to be, you know, is this okay with everyone else, but just, you know, what, what do I want to live? When you coach coaches, mm -hmm. do you do the same thing? Absolutely. Because, um, so these days that's pretty much what I do because I've um, sort of reached a, a standard in this industry where, um, you know, I, I, I can coach coaches. I can let them know, well, these are the mistakes that most coaches make. Because a lot of coaches, you know, they go and they do a course and then they come out of that course and they don't actually have clients. And they start to feel like frauds because they're saying, wow, you know, I'm here saying to people that they can make their dreams come true and I'm not even making my own dream come true. So the first part of it is that, letting them know that, you know, 
it is going to work out for them, that there's just a few business things and a few branding things and a few personal things that need to be worked on. And of course, because they're coaches, they believe in coaching, so they really kind of go for what you're saying. Basically, it sounds like you need to create a business plan in anything that you're doing here. Yes and no. The interesting thing is that with business plans, a lot of people think that that is kind of like a, a schedule for everything that's going to happen for the next two years. But these days, you know, particularly in the last five years, business has become so fluid. Things are changing so quickly that really what you want is you want an idea for what it is you want to bring to the world, but not a business plan in the old terms. Not sort of like, and you know, by year two I'll have this many staff and by year three I'll have this many staff and we'll move into this kind of building because you really can't know. I mean, the fact that if, if you think about it, um, you know, 15 years ago, no one knew what the internet was going to be capable of. So everyone was thinking that they would have to be gathered together in an office. Whereas these days, you know, half my staff are in, in the office in situ and the other half are in different countries. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, planning the business, you really want to be planning sort of three to six months in advance. But then when it comes to planning who you want to be within that business, that's the bit that people really need to get right because that's going to be what drives everything. That's going to be what people are buying. Sound, it sounds kind of difficult to figure out how to coach yourself when you're trying to coach everybody else. And, and this is it. This is why you know, I've got my coaches too. That's why coaches need coaches just like everybody else. Everybody is so close to their own life that they can't see it. It's just like, it's, it's right up here. You can't read from a page that's just right up against your face. It can't be done. And that's why you need someone that has some critical distance that can kind of just give you that objective viewpoint and um, also sort of remind you of things about you, strengths that you have that maybe you've forgotten. Because there's a lot of people uh, that are so kind of hard on themselves. They so want to get it right that they start to block out what's great about themselves. And they need to be reminded of that. They need to be reminded of those strengths so they're not coming from a place of when I fix this and when I fix that, then I can coach. Well, it feels like we all beat ourselves down. And we all, it's like I'm coaching somebody else. And she said, oh, Barry, you're great. <laughs> Remember that. You know, like, and it was really funny because it was like role reversal mm -hmm. here because I was beating her up because she, I don't like to hear negative things. And it was just really kind of funny. What kind of trends do you find coming down the pike as far as coaching or oh, creating well, your dream? Yeah, um, so there are trends, there are ways that happen. So if you remember a few years ago, The Secret was huge. Yes. And it's a movie that I love and a lot of good friends of mine are in that movie and I think it's an excellent movie. And it's talking all about um, how the dream works on a quantum level, all about feeling a certain way and then energetically attracting things to you, magnetizing them to you. But then there was a kind of a bit of a, a sort of a reaction against that and people saying, oh, but the secret doesn't talk about taking action. Taking action is the thing. That's what we call Newtonian level. That's things happening on a mechanical level. That's the kind of the bit where you pick up the phone and make the phone calls. But in fact, the secret does say that, you know, you've got to take immediate action. But then people started to kind of say, no, forget that. Go with this instead. And we need to be a bit more holistic about it and sort of say, Everything's useful. We find what's useful in that. It's not this or this or this. It's how do we blend those together. It's kind of like, you know, harmonizing everything. Um, and these days, of course, um, a lot of the coaching is around how we can do everything on the Internet. So it's, it's you know, people are um, saying to coaches, what you need to do is you need to, you know, forget about traveling around and doing things live. Forget about one-to-one -one coaching. That's, that's a waste of your time. What you want to be doing is you want to be just uh, recording something once, putting it up on the internet and making thousands and thousands from that one recording. And my point is this, that is one good strategy. If everyone's doing it though, eventually it gets a little saturated and it's harder to make money from that. But also you're doing things for many different reasons. You're not just doing it for the money. You're doing it because you have a gift to give, because you're part of the world. And for me, a big thing that I love is the fact that, you know, a couple of times a week, I'm speaking to a completely different audience in a completely different part of the world and looking them in the eye and really getting what they need from me. And so that strategy, I, I say to some coaches, that's great, we can work that strategy, but let's remember that you need to be loving this too. Another thing I love to do is one-to-one -one coaching. These days I just do it with sort of very high net worth people because the fees are so high, you know, which is a great blessing. But, but also that also keeps me really sharp and really strong as a coach. 
So you, don't, you want to make sure that you are, you know, no matter what field you're in, you want to make sure that your skills are, are up there and are up to date and are constantly being updated and that you, you, know, that you stay strong and flexible within your skill. That makes you stand out from the pack because it, it seems like there's so many coaches. I mean, I'm inundated with PR requests yeah. on coach after coach after coach. And it's like, wait a minute, why does this person stand out? And they're, they're the same. That's exactly it. And part of that then is branding. So there's a lot of people that are sort of being told, oh, you have to get a very special niche. You have to, you know, coach people who are um, both, uh, you know, divorcees and um, immigrants from another country and are lawyers and, and niche yourself very finely. I, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't think you have to niche yourself that finely. But I, I am with Steve Martin on this one where he said, be so great they can't ignore you. <laughs> because I think that when you really know your stuff and you can really coach, um, then people just, by word of mouth, your reputation just spreads and people get that you are something special, that you're not just doing the same rote stuff. With all the massive layoffs mm -hmm. and people down, being downsized and people retiring, a lot of people who are retiring are also re-careering. Yes. What advice would you give to the, those individuals? First of all, celebrate what's happening. A lot of times we, we, we go to the difficult side of it. We say, wow, I've lost certainty around this. I don't know what I'm going to be doing for my job. I, you know, I, I've never done this before. And instead, see it as a great opportunity. If you think two generations ago, if you started out as a butcher, you probably died as a butcher. If you started out as a doctor, you probably died as a doctor. But these days, you get to have several different careers. You get to reinvent yourself. You get to become amazing in completely different ways. And give your gift in lots of different ways. So I say, first of all, celebrate what's happening rather than seeing it as um, a reaction to a crisis. And then the next thing you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you're doing something you absolutely feel great doing and something that really suits who you are. And the third thing then that you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you monetize that. Because there are some people that are doing one and two, they're getting excited and they're starting to train in something else, be it coaching or acting or um, you know, starting their own business, being an entrepreneur, but then you really have to make sure that you can m become wealthy, not just kind of keep your body and soul together, but become wealthy doing that thing. And that takes asking quite specific questions. And that's one thing that I've really done well over the last few years myself is gotten really, really good at money. And a lot of that is learning to how to ask better questions and learning how to um, see what's out there and what's available and learning from other people's mistakes so I don't have to make all the mistakes myself. What would you say is your best question do you ask when you're talking about money? Because women notoriously are afraid to ask about money. Yes. I think the starter question I always ask is, and it's going to sound like a quite a negative thing, but it's like, how bad does money feel to you? You know, just get it on the table here. Let's, let's not kind of get too self-helpy too quickly. And let's just say, you know, how, how bad does it feel? And people will say things like, wow, you know what? I cry at night when I think about money, or I just don't, I don't even go there, it's that painful to me, or, you know, sometimes I feel good, I feel good when I get a sale, but then I feel really bad when there's a day when I don't get a sale. So if we start to identify what the emotions are doing around money, then we can start to put a plan in place, because it's, it's not really about strategy, the strategies for making money are out there. But it's really about our people working those strategies, if they feel great and excited consistently, and they're kind of coming from a very curious place of, oh, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? This is working. Why is this working? Rather than, um, you know, oh, this is working. Oh, thank goodness. And this isn't working. Let's forget about it and go, go to the movies. Then, you know, this is what kind of closes people down. So that I, I'd say identifying what is the emotional pattern around money, not just, you know, what are the old beliefs about money, but just what are your emotional patterns and how we can start to... Um, get new stuff on board that you can change those patterns so you can feel consistently good about money no matter what the money's doing. I love money. Me too. I think it's the greatest <laughs> thing. I, but with people shifting in jobs and creating new businesses, many times you're working for somebody who is much younger than you. How do you handle that? I think the first thing that you do, if you're working for someone who's much younger than you, I'd start to get excited because they have particular skill sets that 
us older people don't have. I'm, I myself am 44 years old now, and I know that from 19 year olds I can learn a lot. A lot of my good friends now are very, very young. I'm friends with um, the, the great violin prodigy, um, Yuri Revit, she's only 20 years old. Another friend of mine, Stephanie, she's only 19. And these are good friends and I learn so much from them because they grew up in a completely different way. They, they have a different way of seeing things, a different way of doing things. And it's not just about that they can do stuff with my iPad and I can't. It's not <laughs> just on that level, but just kind of fresh eyes in a fresh way. In the same way as, you know, we always want to go to the elders, so we want to find out from the oldest people in our community, you know, what is it, what's their wisdom? And so I would see that as a great opportunity to, you know, learn, you know, what's a new way, what's in that new world, what's available for me. It's a great way of becoming younger, just being around younger people. Keep your mind stimulated. Keep your mind stimulated and also, you know, your body. So go, go with them to whatever classes they're taking in the gym. Go with them, you know, skateboarding, whatever it takes. And, and then also, you know, realize that, yes, they might have jurisdiction when it comes to this is what we're doing now. But that doesn't mean that they're not respecting everything that you're bringing. They're very, very grateful. Perhaps they're learning from you how to negotiate in a more dignified way or how to speak more gently or how to slow things down when things get a bit too hectic. Or, you know, there's just a, a whole range. range of things that, that, the, that, that people are learning from you. So don't ever think it's just, you know, orders are coming down and you feel kind of squashed by those orders. That's, that's not what's going on. It's, it's much more beautiful and complex than that. One of the things you're very much up on is codependency. Mm -hmm. When I think of codependence, I think of two people being codependent in a personal relationship. Yes. Is this also applicable to a business relationship? Oh, it is, absolutely. So for the people who aren't clear what codependence is, originally it was used to describe um, for someone who was married to, say, an alcoholic or an addict. And the idea was that they were enabling that person. And in order to do that, what the codependent does is they kind of leave their own center. So they kind of, rather than staying in themselves and doing what they need to do to be strong themselves and live their life, instead they're constantly leaving that idea and leaving that dream and leaving that self and looking at what, what do other people need with the belief that if they look after other people enough, then other people will turn around and look after them. And it ends up that you can have, say, an addict and a codependent or two codependents together. And it's really two people leaning way too heavily on each other and getting sort of enmeshed in an unhealthy way rather than realizing that there's supposed to be this lovely little space. There's supposed to be a boundary, an elegant boundary that you know, we invite people in for certain things and they can speak to us in a certain way. And then we can ask them to politely leave when we feel that um, it's time for that. And a lot of people just haven't got a great sense of that and so this happens um, in business practices as well so it could happen that you have someone who's codependent and they're say you know very very worried about what's going on in an employee's family life now it's fine to sort of ask you know so how are the kids doing but not to sit there and have a full conversation about it and be worried about it and carry that energy so when people start to realize what's their own business what's somebody else's business, you know, what's, what's theirs to handle and nothing to do with you, and then what's God's business, what's you know, nothing to do with any of us, which is you know, things like the weather or some other things that we can't handle. When we realize what's our business and what belongs to, to others, then we can start to live very clean. We can start to live in a very pure energy and not feel so emotionally exhausted all the time. In a situation like that, is it easy to break out of a codependency? So breaking out of codependency is all about um, really starting to ask yourself, what do I need? Because a lot of people who are codependent, they've become completely numbed to their needs. They can't even tell when they're hungry, they can't tell when they're tired a lot of the time, and they certainly can't tell what they're feeling. So you ask a codependent, how are they feeling, and they'll say fine, or not good, but they won't be able to really pinpoint, this is how I'm feeling and this is probably why. You know, it's a combination of me not having eaten for three hours. It's a combination of me, you know, taking on board someone else's problems. They, they, they're not great. And I, I put my hand up as a, as a former codependent, you know, someone who still has to be vigilant for that, that I, I really know this from the inside, that it, it, is, it is so, so easy to do that. It is so easy to lose touch with what it is that you need and want. And a lot of times it's all about learning how to, to identify what you need and want realizing that you don't have to be absolutely dying before you can, can ask for what you need and want, and learning how to elegantly communicate that, to say, you know what, this is, this is what I expect, 
this is not okay with me, this is okay with me, thank you for this, no thank you, I don't want that. And just to be able to be very clear, and in fact, I started to realize that it's, it's to do with honesty. That a lot of times when we're codependent, we think that we're being lovely because we're looking after everybody and we're putting ourselves second, third, fourth, hundredth on the list. But in fact, it's not being kind to us, which isn't kind to anybody else either because we're lying to them. When we say we're fine and we're not fine, when we say, oh, don't worry about that, and in fact it is something that needs to be looked at, then um, we're not doing anyone any favors. One of the things that you're really involved in is word literacy for women or yes. girls. Well, women and girls, yes, okay. absolutely. Um, because um, it's extraordinary how many women in the world, even in cities like New York, cannot read and write. And for me, that that is so often the way out for women who are having a really tough time. That they have to, if they can't earn their way out because all that's available to them is entry level jobs and minimum wage, then they have to learn their way out. They have to, you know, really study. They have to, if they're not surrounded by an amazing peer group, if they don't have great elders who can teach them, hey, this is what money's all about. Hey, this is, you know, how we handle our emotions. Hey, you know what? This is what's going on. If you don't have that around you, and so few women in the world do, then the only way you have access to that is through things like books and through doing something as sophisticated as going to a seminar. But for most women, having the money to go to the seminar isn't available. So just being able to read and being able to just lift yourself up enough that you can then get to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage is vital. And the reason that I'm so interested in that for women is because in so many countries that is put last, that the boys' education is put first, and whereas absolutely, you know, equally every boy on the planet should be able to read and write and love it. Then, um, you know, at the same time though, it's, it's women who become the mothers for the next generations. And that's why I'm so interested is because when a woman can't write, then her, her daughters don't learn that in the home. And her sons, if, if their son's education is interrupted for whatever reason. Does this have to do with poverty or does it have to do with culture or where they're living? Um, a lot of it has to do with poverty. Simply, if there, if there aren't schools, you can't go to school. But you'd be amazed at how many people come from very privileged backgrounds and have seemingly amazing educations and they can't read and write and they are very, very embarrassed about it. So I have people who um, are extremely wealthy, worth millions, and it might be that they, they married into that, or it might be that they inherited it, or it might be that they even made it. I've had some people come to me and they've managed to, to do it, by nev but they've never written anything down. They've just gotten good at managing people and getting other people to do all the reading and writing. And often they'll say something like, well, I'm dyslexic. But these days there's so much can be done around dyslexia. It, it is a very um, common condition. Um, a lot can be done around dyslexia, but a lot of times people are saying dyslexia, but in fact, it's just much easier than saying, I never learned to read and write. That just boggles my mind. It is it's extraordinary, a... isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I guarantee if you go into a beautiful restaurant and you're sitting there and you're presuming that the only person who might have a literacy problem is in washing the pots and pans, you're absolutely incorrect. It is someone sitting at, that, at a table near you. And this is why I, I just love it that when people come to me and say, that's me, can you help me? Because there's, there's a lot of embarrassment, there's a lot of shame that people wear around this. A lot of shame that people wear around anything that they feel they're not good at. If they feel that they're not good physically, they feel that they're not good at reading, they feel that they're not good at making money, they feel they're not good at relationships. The thing that's holding them back is they're not asking for the help because they feel that this weakness somehow makes them less than. So if they feel insignificant to ask for help and you notice something how do you say something to somebody about their inequity their uh, shortcomings well the way that I do it is when I'm just one-to-one -one with people I just I get straight to it they, they know that I know my stuff so if someone says something to me and it might be something like oh would you be able to help me get my business to another level or yeah, I was wondering if I'd get some relationship advice or they say something that's kind of fuzzy. I'll just look right at them and I go, what is it really? What are we really talking about here? Let's just get it done. And they know that I'm talking about the thing. And I'll just take their hand and I'll say, honey, we've got this. It's okay, this is what I do. And they'll, they'll often cry and a lot of the times it's the first time they've told anyone. And that's a great honor for me. That's, that that's I take wow. that very, very seriously and, and I respect it enormously. And we always then get them to that place of strength. All right, so how does one filter out or get them to like a, a, a book reading or something where they can learn? Or is it best 
in that kind of a situation that they really need a one-on-one? -on -one? Well, it, it really depends. Like, um, there's loads and loads of strategies, but the, the most basic one that really helps with everything is get a team around it. Just ask yourself, what people do I need? You know, do I need someone who's very specifically about this skill? Or do I just need more cheerleaders around me? Do I need more loving people around me? And just identify, or is it a combination of all those things? And just identify who is not there right now. And perhaps those people are already there, but you're not tapping into them as a resource. That you're not kind of saying, hey, listen, you're great at this. And I've always admired that about you. Would you mind teaching me? And people are delighted. People love to teach. I think everyone's a teacher. I, I love being a teacher. That's how I see myself. I know there's kind of a rock star element about getting up on these stages in front of thousands of people and going on TV around the world. But the part that I really identify with is I'm a teacher. I'm just, you know, my mind is racing here on women who become millionaires. Yes. And you're saying they can't read or write. Yes. Because I've yeah. heard about baseball players who yes. can't sign their name. <laughs> now, all right, that's a little blowing your mind um, episode two where they're worth millions every yes. year yeah. and they can't read or write. So... And I understand where people don't know much about finances, but in today's day and age, with the television, with the internet, with everything, I just can't get well, my head around yeah. it. Well, the interesting thing is, whenever there's any kind of a weakness, we can do two things. First of all, we can compensate for that weakness, or we can strengthen that weakness. So the people who get to that position where they have a huge strength, something like having millions or having an amazing relationship, um, and then they have a huge weakness, whether that's you know, literacy or health or something like that, they've compensated. So they've found ways of either delegating things or avoiding things. They've found a way around, and, and they, they've done that very successfully. But what you want to do anytime you've got any kind of challenges, you want to compensate so that you get yourself into a, um, a, a, a position where you're not super vulnerable, but then you also want to strengthen. And they come to me at that point because you'd also be amazed that there are men who are um, very, very successful and they're seen as kind of the bachelor around town. And then you find out, in fact, that they've never made love to a woman. And that's their area of embarrassment. So everyone's got something. Everyone's got something that they're hiding from people. And we just take that thing that they consider their shame or their weakness. First of all, we explain to them there's no shame about it at all. It's just that they weren't taught. And we make sure that they get the team around it that they need. Wow. Judy May, in the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? I'd like to let people know that they're doing better than they think and that they have strengths and they have things that they have learned and things that they've gained that perhaps they're not seeing as gold. It, it really is pure gold. And instead, they're telling themselves a story that they might be washed up or that it's too late or that they were too broken by a situation like a divorce or losing a home or losing a job. That is not the case. You, what you've got to do is you've got to make that mean something. You've got to say, you know what? I'm stronger for this. I'm better for this. And now I'm going to go out and make something even bigger happen. I'm going to redouble my dream. I'm going to not dream the old dream. I'm going to dream a better dream. And I'm going to go out there and make it happen and get that team around it. Get the help that you need because we all need it. And it's there. Judy May, thank you so much. Oh, a pleasure. I'm thrilled that you're back. And what are you doing to accomplish your dream? Are you pulling in the people you need to accomplish it? Or are you just wishing it comes into your lap? Love to hear about what you're doing to get to the next level. Please write us here at The Woman's Connection. Bye now. <laughs>